Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Verses today, Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going to see my betrayer is at hand. You may be seated. All right, I'm going to pray real quick, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, we ask for your, your help this morning, Holy Spirit. Come and just make the word just clear and real to us, and we ask that we could just know Jesus more. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, well, we are, we are in uh, the beginning of Passion Week, so today is Palm Sunday. This is not a Palm Sunday message. I am actually really terrible at seasonal messages. Like if it were up to me, we would have just gone straight through 1 John, like all the way through Christmas, Christmas Eve. That's just, that's just more how I roll. Um, so we are going to talk about Gethsemane. So it's like semi-seasonal, okay? So this is this Thursday of the Passion Week. And um, specifically, I want to I wanna look at Jesus in Gethsemane his prayer, and and I want to see how that uh, applies to us. So Jesus actually calls this time his hour. He says that phrase several times in the Gospels, my hour has come, um, the hour of trial. I think it's in Luke that he says this is the the hour of the power of darkness, you know, pretty intense. And um, even though Jesus's hour was very unique, you know, I mean, there's, there's nothing like what Jesus experienced that hour. And, and when he says hour, he's talking about that roughly 18-hour period, starting with Gethsemane, you know, the Thursday night of Passion Week, and then going all the way through the, the, the Good Friday, his time on the cross. And it was unique. You know, it was this collision of the forces of darkness, the wrath of God, and the worst of human evil, like all coming together at the same time. But we, we also have our, our hour of trial. You know, some, some of us have more than one, uh, but all of us go through seasons in our life where it's just hard. Suffering is just more than normal. It's, it's intense. And, um, so that's where we're going this morning. I want to look at, again, Jesus in the garden, his, his prayer there, and specifically what that means for us when we're going through suffering in our, in our own way. So let's pick up the story. Um, just, this is what we just read. So I'm, I'm using the Mark version. So Mark 14, verses 32 through 35. It says, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Gethsemane was, uh, you know, we call it the garden of Gethsemane, but it was actually more like an orchard. It was like an orchard of, of olive trees. But, as we'll see later, it's really important that we call it garden. 
So it goes on. They went to this, this orchard. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Okay, so first off, I want to just look at uh, a few things that this tells us about Jesus. First of all, Jesus needed people in his time of pain. I, I love this part of the story that he, he asks three of his disciples to come with him. I think when we're going through our suffering, this can be really hard for some of us to, to ask for help, to, to reach out for prayer. It can be embarrassing, you know, to, to let somebody in on how bad it really is. You know, we just tell them, it's good, yeah, it's good. Jesus invited these three disciples in and he, he invited them into the moment as well, not just like, I think sometimes it can be a cop out to like, oh yeah, I had a hard time a few years ago and then I got through it, you know, everything's going good now. But he invited them in real time as he was experiencing it. That's, that's real vulnerability. And we see that in Jesus, that he's inviting them in and he's saying essentially, I, I need you right now. I mean, the son of God was basically saying, I need help. I can't do this on my own. And that's, that's remarkable. And it also just teaches a lot about how we should walk out our times of suffering. The second thing we see is that this is interesting that Jesus was selective in who he chose to accompany him. Um, you know, he didn't share this intimate experience that he was going through with the crowds. He didn't, he didn't even ask the other eight, you know, we're, we're minus one now because Judas left a little while ago, but he didn't, he didn't ask the other eight disciples to join him in this part, just the three. And, and I've thought a lot about what is, you know, why, why what, is, what does that mean for us? And, and I, think, I think Jesus is actually modeling not just how to process pain well, but how to do friendship well. I think that there are, there are some friendships and relationships around us that we invite people in and we're vulnerable, and then other people on the outside, we don't. And that might sound exclusive or weird, but that's actually how we do healthy relationships. You know, it's, it's actually not healthy to share all of your emotional struggles all of the time on Facebook. You know, it's, it, it's awkward, and you, you need people to process it with. Now, now, after you've processed with those close friends around you, can you share vulnerable stories on Facebook, on a Sunday morning? Yeah, absolutely. But we need people who we can be raw and unedited around, where you can say the wrong thing, you know? Um, and I think that's what we can learn from Jesus here is that we trust, we have, we, we have a few safe relationships where we can just be, we can be raw. We can be wrong if we need to be wrong, you know, but we can just be honest with them. Um, the third thing that we see about Jesus in this little section is, is that he wasn't immune to sadness or depression. Okay, so it says he began to be greatly distressed and troubled, and then he says, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. I like um, Frederick Bruner's paraphrase of that last part. Uh, he says, I feel so bad that I could die. That's basically what Jesus was saying. I, I feel so bad that I could die. Um, the, the Greek is even more interesting here, that greatly distressed, it means to be terrified, alarmed, or amazed. And then troubled can also mean great distress or anguish or depressed. So, so remember, Jesus was all of these things. Jesus was terrified, alarmed, depressed, confusion seemed seem to have been part of it. Uh, we, we looked at this passage a little bit in, in Gap Year this last week. I was trying to, to steal insights from them for my sermon. And, um, and there was a lot, uh, something that uh, Ella Mowry said that I really appreciated. She, we got to this part and she said, I feel like I can relate to Jesus more when I see him go through this, when, he's, when we see the pain he's going through. 
Jesus experienced the full range of human emotion. You know, this is not the Prozac Jesus. You know, this is not, um, I I used to grow up watching uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and I watched a clip of it this week. I was like, is my childhood memory correct? And it was a little bit better than I, than I remember as, a, as an eight-year-old. But I, I remember just thinking, this Jesus has no emotion. Like, he just says everything in clipped phrases, you know, like stopping and starting every few seconds, just staring at people, long, awkward stares, those, like, very non-Jewish piercing blue eyes that he has in that movie. I mean, that, that's what I grew up with. And, and later, as I realized that he actually was full of joy, sometimes full of sorrow, uh, full of laughter, it really, it really stunned me. It really attracted me to Jesus. Um, here's just a little sampling. Psalm 45 said of the coming Messiah, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Translation, Jesus was the happiest man around. Now, at the same time, here's another prophecy about the Messiah, okay? So Jesus wasn't just like happy Mr. Jokes, like clouding around all the time. Like we have Isaiah 53 that says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And I I heard one uh, preacher a while ago kind of downplay this and say, you know, he was only acquainted with grief, but he had the oil of gladness more than anyone. So really, he was just like happy all the time. And it's like, that's not really what a man man of sorrows means. And so the, the point is that Jesus went deep in all of the human emotions in the best and most holy and most attractive way possible. He was the most joyful person but he also experienced the depth of sorrow that few people around him did. This is what it meant for Jesus to be fully human while also being fully God. I, I love, this might be my favorite part of my sermon this morning, just, just looking at Jesus, like just meditating on, on who he was and who he is still today. What does it mean that he's, he's God and sinless, but also that he's completely human? I agree with Ella. I I do feel like I can relate to him more, and I love him more because of these things. Um, I want to share this quote. I shared it last year, but I want to share it again. This is from Dorothy Sayers. She says, whatever reason God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death, he had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he is playing with his creation, He has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. I love that. So how did, how did Jesus get through his hour of trial? How did he get through the depression, the, the fear, the confusion that he was experiencing and sharing with his disciples in that moment? He prayed. That's what Jesus' go-to was, was prayer. He falls on his face and he prays. And amazingly, we have the prayer. I mean, what a gift that we have the prayer that Jesus prayed in that moment, that intimate moment, that holy moment. So here it is. And this is really what we're going to be picking apart for, you know, the rest of the sermon is Mark 14, verse 36. Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This this 22-word prayer might be the most beautiful prayer that's ever been uttered. For sure, it was the hinge of human history, for sure. And actually, another insight I gleaned from my, my, my GAP students, 
from Abby Cantrell. Abby Cantrell pointed out in class that there's a lot of similarities between Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and Adam in the Garden of Eden. That both moments were the hinge of history. One towards death and evil, and one, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is why we, important why we still call it the Garden. Jesus shifted history toward life and resurrection with his power in the Garden. Okay, I want to read a really meaty quote here. All right, this is like, we should just dwell on it for five minutes, but we don't have time. So I'm just going to read it and just know that it's more awesome than 30 seconds. So Fulton Sheen says, As Adam lost the heritage of union with God in a garden, so now our blessed Lord ushered in its restoration in a garden. Eden and Gethsemane were the two gardens around which revolved the fate of humanity. In Eden, Adam sinned. In Gethsemane, Christ took humanity's sin upon himself. In Eden, Adam hid himself from God. In Gethsemane, Christ interceded with his father. In Eden, God sought out Adam in his sin of rebellion. In Gethsemane, the new Adam sought out the father in his submission and resignation. In Eden, a sword was drawn to prevent entrance into the garden and thus immortalizing of evil. In Gethsemane, the sword would be sheathed. I just love that. Especially that little, like, sword inside there in the end. I thought, wow, that's, I never, I never would have thought of that. So this is where we're going to go. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm taking this outline from Pete Gregg's book, God on Mute. Uh, he's, he's exploring unanswered prayer, and I would recommend that book to anyone, especially this week. Uh, the whole book is is centered around kind of the, the Passion Week days, you know, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. And it's, it's just one of my favorite books on God and suffering of all time. So he, he gives this outline to the prayer that we just read from Jesus. Abba, Father, we hold on to God's love. Okay, this is what Jesus did, and this is how we too can respond to our suffering. All things are possible for you, we hold out for God's power. Remove this cup from me. We pray with honesty. And then yet, not what I will, but what you will. We pray and surrender. Okay, so let's go through each one of these phrases. So the first one, Abba, Father. This is why I chose the Gospel of Mark, because this is the only one where they use the word Abba, which is a really intimate and tender phrase. But at the same time, the word Abba, it, it, it does denote respect as well. So here's a quote from, from Daryl Bach, because there's, I, I don't know, there's just been a lot of controversy around the word Abba. Uh, some people have related it to the word Daddy. Uh, a lot of books have been read, kind of to that end, uh, written to that end. And um, I think scholars are saying now that that's been a little bit of a, an exaggeration. The, the reality is that the word is both intimate and respectful at the same time. So hopefully I didn't ruin anyone's like prayer life right there. You can still call da uh, God daddy if you want, okay? You can't call him daddy God. You can't. No, you can't. That's all right. So Daryl Bach says about it, I just, I deferred to the expert here. He says, believers may address God with the endearing term Abba because he is our father Yet we should never use this term in the spirit of unsavory familiarity, but with the full acknowledgement of his majesty. So here's the, the point, though, is that Jesus, in his time of pain, he went to God as his father, as his Abba. And that's so powerful for us, too. We remember that he's our father, that he loves us. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said about... Um, Oh my gosh, well, I don't have my notes. What, what was his hero? George McDonald. Thank you, you guys are good. That was just a quiz. Um, C.S. Lewis once said about George McDonald that he understood that fatherhood was at the core of the universe. And I think that's especially true of the fatherhood of God. It is literally at the core of the universe. And so in his time of suffering, Jesus went there. He said, you're, you're my Abba, you love me. And so that's what we do. We remind ourselves, okay, even though this, this awful thing is happening, even though I'm confused, I'm anxious, I'm in pain, 
God loves me. 1 John 4, 16 and 17, I have the Amplified because it brings these words out. It says, we have come to know by personal observation and experience is what that word means. And have believed with deep, consistent faith the love which God has for us. God is love. And so we, we experience it. We rely on it. We stand on that in times of suffering. God is my Abba, and he loves me. No matter what circumstances or emotions say, he loves me right now. Okay, the next, the next line, Jesus then went on to pray, all things are possible for you. So th- this, this gets into the genius of this prayer. So not only does, does Jesus acknowledge that he's Abba, he's the God of love, but he's also the Almighty, the God of power. And it, it just so happens that these are the two hardest facets of God to hold on to when we experience or witness great suffering in the world. We, we want to diminish one or the other. And in fact, that, that's what uh, theodicies are all about. Theodicy is a, is a the, theological word for uh, trying to solve the problem of pain and suffering with the existence of God in the world. And they have to wrestle with the fact that God is both loving and he's all powerful. Because if he's both, if his character's good and he has all the means in the world to take away suffering, then why doesn't he do it? So Jesus doesn't answer this philosophical problem right here, but he just acknowledges that they're both true. He just says, God is love, Abba, Father, and everything is possible for you. This is important for us to to hold on to, that God is fully able and often does produce miracles when we ask him to. Here's a couple examples that have um, been meaningful to me. So, and both of these are, are, are Lyme disease stories. Most of you guys know that I've had chronic Lyme for almost 15 years. So I recently heard this story about uh, the author John Mark Comer. His wife, Tammy Comer, had chronic Lyme disease for, I think, close to the same, maybe, maybe 15 years-ish, somewhere along those lines. And for hers, it actually got so bad that they started to prepare for her to die. They were fully expecting her to be gone, that John would be a, a single dad. So from the guidance of a friend, they started looking into Tam, Tammy's family history, and they discovered that about four generations back, somebody had put, and I know this is, is going to put some of you guys on tilt, this story, so just, this is just I'm just telling you what happened. Um, about four generations back, that somebody put a, a curse on everyone in her family, that the firstborn female of every, of every uh, family would, would die early of an illness. So they started doing the research and going through the family tree, and they found out that every single firstborn female had died early of an illness, except for one, except for one. As they were researching, that one person left, called them to let them know that she had stage four cancer. So they, again, on the, on the guidance of a friend, they went to a, a healing and deliverance expert, somebody who prayed for these kind of things normally, and in that prayer session, they, they broke off this family curse. And the way John Mark Comer tells it, he said that in that, as they were praying, Tammy's entire body just, it like released, like all of this tension and all of the symptoms went away. And from that moment on, that was four years ago, she has been completely healed of Lyme disease. 15 years, almost on the edge of death. Here's another story, a little closer to home. Um, so me and my friend Todd Eshpeter were, were diagnosed with Lyme disease around the same time. Uh, he was hospitalized several times um, from relapses and just bad episodes with his Lyme. And one time he was at home and there was a healing evangelist on the TV. And the healing evangelist said, if you wanna be healed, put your hand on the screen and claim it. And Todd was like, what the heck? I don't have, any, I don't have anything to lose. So he put his hand on the screen, and he claimed it. Three months later, Todd's symptoms went into remission, and he has been healed from Lyme disease ever since. That was about, you know, 12, 13 years ago. 
I'm not advocating for every healing evangelist in the world right now, let it be known. I'm just, again, telling you the story of what happened. <laughs> the point is that all things are possible with God. There, his name is above the name of every disease, illness. His name is above death itself. All things are possible with him. Okay, here's the next part of his prayer. He says, this is the most mysterious and incredible part of the whole prayer. He says, remove this cup from me. Okay, first, what is the cup? All right, we have to, we have to figure this out. Um, ancient sources often use the word cup metaphorically as, as suffering or even death in someone's life. So you could think of Socrates, you know, was given the, the cup of poison, and that's how he died. Jesus himself used it in Matthew 20 when he said, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? So it's, it stands for suffering. But for Jesus specifically, we know that it was more than just suffering. Many times in the Hebrew prophets, they would talk about God's wrath as being offered out in a cup to the nations. And then the nations or the individual, whoever would drink this cup and they would stagger and then perish. And that, so this, this cup, this frothing cup was the picture of God's judgment and the picture of his wrath. This was what Jesus was drinking. Physical suffering, for sure. But personally, my opinion is that Jesus was not shrinking back in fear at the, personal, at the physical suffering of the cross. I say that because many martyrs later on in history would, would die gruesome deaths, and they'd be empowered by the Spirit to have, at least according to the stories, have peace and joy mostly to the very end. It was the cup of God's wrath that made Jesus draw back. It was him bearing the sins of the world that caused him to, to waver and fear and tremble in that moment in the garden. How can he ask to avoid it? How is that okay? Jesus felt free to go to his Abba and ask that God would spare him from this cup that presumably God and Jesus had decided on from eternity past that he was going to do. I mean, it just, it boggles the mind that he, he had, and he, was, he had been preaching to his disciples for weeks that he was going to the cross to do this very thing. And then in the moment, he says, uh, is there any other way? Uh, here's, here's a quote from Frederick Bruner, because I, I just, I didn't know what to make of this. And so I, I, I love what he had to say about it. He said, we can only reverently guess what was going through Jesus's mind. Does this cup mean this particular cup of death by crucifixion? And so is Jesus asking his father if he might possibly fulfill God's plan by some other death? Or is Jesus asking whether there might be a postponement? And why does Jesus want this cup removed at all? Is the answer as simple as human shrinking from death? Or is it as deep as horror before God's awful judgment? The moment we are sure we know why, because of Bible verses here or there, all of them surely true enough in their own way, we are probably in danger of presumption. That's the part that, that comforted me a little bit because I just thought, I don't know what to make of this prayer. <laughs> and what he's saying is that there's a mystery. All the text allows us to know is that if at all possible, Jesus wants out and we are asked to honor the mystery of the request. What's so beautiful is that this gives us permission to pray the same way in our own times of suffering. We can be honest with God. If Jesus without sin was able to ask if there was another way around the cup of the cross, then surely we're free to pray honest prayers before God, to, to, to ask him for our desires. And also we can gather from this that it's okay to not, to not be sure of the will of God. That's not a sin. We, we keep on seeking him and keep on praying, but it's not a sin to, to not know. Um, with this, just in our last few minutes, before we get to the last point, I wanted to invite uh, uh, Jess up here, my wife, and just share a couple minutes of this, how this last season has been for her. She just, she had a moment in prayer that reminded me of, of this as I studied it. All right, you gonna keep Edley on? 
Okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, this last season has brought me really to a point of um, brokenness and emptiness like I've never experienced and emotions that I've never really experienced before, like deep rage and anger and under, like I didn't understand and just questioning and um, like Glenn shared, I've, I've walked with Glenn, we've been married for seven years and I've walked with him through Lyme disease and I'm the strong one, as I like to say or the encourager, or the one who will flip it on the bright side and believe and have faith that God does heal. And then this last season, I had Edley, and she was born early, and as you can tell, we're, we're still unknowing why she doesn't eat like she should eat, and we've been in hospitals, in and out of hospitals, and numerous doctors, and it's just left me with panic attacks and anxiety, and I just can't figure it out. Um, so... In all of that, one afternoon, I'm, I think I was just with her. I don't know exact details because my brain is so tired. But um, I think Glenn calls me up and just shares he's having a hard day, which is honestly pretty typical. But in that moment, I hung up the phone. And I was so mad. I just raged at the Lord. Like, how could this be? Like, I can't handle it anymore. I can't deal with her being sick. I can't deal with him being sick. I can't deal with having a job or all the things. And the Lord just said, it's okay that you're angry. And I felt seen. And I honestly felt like, whoa, I actually can be angry and it's okay. Like, I don't have to like, all right, let's get it together. Let's just keep on moving and um, try to figure it out, but I could be real and honest in prayer, and it's still the same. I mean, nothing really changed except that I was like able to release what I probably had been shoving down for a long time. So I I'm still walking it out. I'm still learning that the Lord wants to see us in our honesty, in our realness, and what does it actually mean for me to be real in my emotions and not just like I'll get it together, but going to him in it? Because when I go to him in it, he actually can help me and walk alongside me instead of me pushing away and trying to do it on my own, if that makes sense. So that's, that's what I'm challenging myself to do and everyone else. It's good. All right. Um, Okay, the last, the last thing that, that Jesus prays here, um, he, he ends with, yet not what I will, but what you will. So this is, after his, his honest prayer, this is his surrendering prayer. And this is so many of the Psalms, right? The Psalms are just gut level honest, but then David or whoever, they, they end with the truth, with what they know to be true about God. And Jesus does the same. He says, okay, this is what I want. I prayed my desires honestly, but at the end of the day, it's, it's your will that I want, God. I think surrendering prayer might be the most underrated form of prayer. And it doesn't mean apathy. It doesn't mean resignation. It doesn't mean that we don't war spiritually. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means that after we war spiritually, after we wrestle like Jacob did, we go back to the character of God. And so Jesus' prayer begins and ends with the good character of God. With Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. And then he ends with, I trust you. I trust that your will is good. What happens on the other side of this prayer? What happens on the other side of this prayer is amazing. From this point on, Jesus doesn't falter again. He goes boldly and bravely to crucifixion and the cup of God's wrath. Whatever transpired in this prayer between Jesus and God the Father, it strengthened him so much that he was able to face a level of suffering that none of us have ever faced before. I want to end with uh, Hebrews 12, verses 2 through 3. This, this, in other words, is what Jesus was enabled to do from his prayer in Gethsemane. 
Um, where am I starting? Where's, where's for the joy? There it is. Okay. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. <laughs> is it, we, just, we just read about how he was distressed and depressed. But after this moment, he's able to put joy before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is what we're doing today. We're, we're considering the one who endured such opposition so in our suffering, we won't be weary. And we know that Jesus rose from the dead. We know that he's going to bring in an age of peace and righteousness whether or not I'm healed today or tomorrow, the healing is coming. It might come next week or it might come when Jesus comes back, you know? But we know this is what we have to look forward to because of what Jesus prayed and what he did on the cross and because he rose again. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for the good news. I pray that this week, what you did 2,000 years ago would be made new in our spirits, that you would show us why it matters for our lives right now, why it matters for our church and our city today, God. Yeah, I would pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. I